How does this look? This defense is impregnable. On my right, we have a boy. Joking. So we have Mohammed Hijab and Brother Jacob. Jacob, I've spoken to him a couple of weeks ago about contingency, and he just wants to ask me some questions. I'm going to leave the interview for you guys, inshallah. Hijab, make sure you get him as well. Of course, of course. No, I'll give it to him. I'll give it to him. I'll just. But, but keep it always distant, oh. it's, it's oh, it's too loud, yeah? Alright. So, you guys can... So, no, no, I'll start with you. So, can you introduce yourself? Tell me what, who you are, what you support, what your background is, and why you wanted to talk to me. Sure, so, um... So hold it, yeah. yeah, hold it. When I, when I speak, you hold it, yeah. Okay, alright. Alright, so, um, hello all. Uh, my name is Jacob. Uh, I've been wanting to, um, meet, uh, Hijab for some time, so I'm, I'm uh, I confess, a little bit of a fanboy in that I disagree with pretty much everything he says, but in terms of the sort of intellectual debating type... Uh, a bit of a bit of a hero of mine, especially after I'm watching. Uh, to be honest, I don't think Cosmic Skeptic held his own in that uh, Oxford debate. Really. But that doesn't have to be yeah, God. Debate over, thank you it very much. Not, because that does not have to be God. I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. That's, our, that's our understanding of God. Yeah, it does not have to be yeah, God. Yeah, for us, a necessary existence is something which is this is the perfect. Couldn't be any other way. It explains everything else. That's our definition of God. Um, yeah, no. So I'm, I'm a sort of. Uh, General, uh, non-believer, libertarian, nationalist type, and I just want uh, to. Tommy support? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Tommy support as well, but um, but but against against anyone who's who's in support of violence. But I think okay. um, I find that I, I reconcile that with Tommy very easily. I don't think he's a violent person. I think he had he made some mistakes in his past, but I think he's a very good man. I think he's fighting for England. Uh, I've got a lot of respect for him, as I do for a lot of men. <laughs> I mean, it's the first time I've met someone who's described me as a hero and Tommy Robinson as a hero in the same breath. Very possible, in very different ways. <laughs> Whoa. All right, so you said you read my book. A while ago, I admit so. All right, so what, what kind of... Um, we're talking about Kalam cosmological yes. arguments yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, I, where I make the kind of what's referred to as the argument of contingency. Yeah, Leibniz. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, Leibniz is who kind of... He's a no, main I, proponent I, I, nowadays. The Arabs, the Arabs did it first. Yeah, yeah. Well, Aristotle had his own version, right? The Greeks had their own version. The Arabs, and then the Enlightenment. All right. So, what what were your thoughts on the argument? Can you summarize what you understand from the argument first? So, okay. So, as I understand it, thank you. Yeah. Um, it's sort of it's basically Aquinas' third way, isn't it? He's, I think it's his third way. To some he says, extent. He says, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Leibniz sort of adapted it from him. He says uh, there are contingent things, possible uh, existences. Uh, in this world, and um, obviously everything needs to have some sort of cause, otherwise it wouldn't be contingent, and this must be basically a, a chain of causality terminating in a necessary being, and we, the Christian or the Muslim, cause that being God. Uh, correct me there if that's... Yeah, so you're, you're right to some extent. There's, okay. two ways, there's two ways of doing contingency, okay. right? One of them is through causality and the other one is through explanation. That's traditionally so. In other words, the, the contingency argument, or what I think, it, I think it is a Kalam cosmological argument as well. That's my, yeah. I disagree with that, but. Yeah, there's a difference of opinion on that. Either way, it can either be done through causality or it can be done through um, explanation. It doesn't need causation, right? But yeah, you could go through that route and say, okay, well. If you believe in cause and effect, a priori, as well as cosmologically, like in other words, things in the cosmological environment which are affected by something have a cause. A, a phenomena which has um, something that brought rise to it, which is the textbook definition of a cause, has, uh, of, um, basically has a cause. That phenomena has a cause. If you believe in that a priori, or if you believe in that, even from a cosmological perspective, you could argue that, well, then they have to have a, a first cause or whatever, right? But that's not the only way of doing contingency. So you can do it through um, dependence as well. Yeah, that's, dependence that's and, and yeah, yeah. So what, what do you think about that argument? About the, um, the dependency one, yeah? Yeah, uh, so, yeah, so I, I separate that, by the way, from the Kalam. The, like, the Kalam I hold to be the sort of traditional one that um, Craig popularized, the sort of you, uh, whatever begins to exist as a cause, the universe begins to exist, therefore, therefore God, basically. Um, and then the, the contingency one, I think, I think it's stronger, to be honest with you. I mean, the Kalam really is, is on shaky ground on both its premises, but the contingency one is more 
more it's much more impressive because at face value it does seem as if okay you know an infinite regression seems incompatible with everything that we understand about the world uh, and so it, it sort of it seems very reasonable to say yes this this must terminate somewhere in necessity um, I think it's a bit of a leap that they then call that God so people like David Hume said no why can't it be um, I think it was using the persona of Cleanthes he said like oh no it, um, uh, he, he, said, he says first to, um, to, his, to his debater, he says, um, first, first of all, you know, you're assuming that there is some, some necessary uh, being, and you know, he, he, he doubts whether you can even use the term necessary as having any coherent meaning. And then he says, okay, suppose, suppose uh, that there is, he says, why can't this just be the totality of the universe? And then, so, so for me, there's several issues with it. It's just for one, if there is something necessary, okay, uh, it could just be the totality of all that exists. I realise there's problems with that. There's plenty of counter arguments to make. One could simply be that there, that there are just contingent things, okay, and it doesn't seem like uh, sort of logical, you know, 100% that there must be something um, uh, necessary. Well, I'd say those are the two main things. The other problem is, from an objectivist point of view, right, we might say, um, you know, necessary could, is anything that you, you couldn't conceive, um, like you couldn't conceive otherwise. Like, uh, and some, some people say, no, the planet Jupiter is actually necessary. And, and you might say, oh, well, you can conceive of planet Jupiter not being there, but can you really? You can, is, is it possible to? I, I, I'm not sure if you can conceive of a universe in which there are things that aren't, are not there, which leads me to believe maybe there are more than one necessary existences. So that's about three arguments. Yeah. So with that, the reason why I called it that is to show that this is not one argument. Right. Yes. Right. So the yeah, one that argument yeah. Yeah, yeah. El Ghazali, the one that um, yeah. William Lane Craig focuses on is the Ghazalian one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even Al Ghazali, in his his most famous book at Tahafut al Falasifa, which is the incoherence, incoherence right. of the philosophers, yeah. Yeah. very good. Um, even he he postulates more than one argument, which right. is. Okay. So he makes an argument for movement, which is quite similar to you were talking about Aquinas. Yeah, that's yeah, that's. So, but he says, look, he says that, for example, this is one of his other because you talked about one of his arguments. He mentioned this in one of his books. He says everything that begins to exist has a cause. The, the universe began to exist, or the alam. By the way, the universe is not a good translation of what Ghazali actually said. Oh, what's the he says the world has a, uh, began to exist, not the universe. The universe is a new term, right? So he says al alam or the, the world began to exist, therefore the world has a cause, right? Yes. So William Lane Craig latched onto this, he makes all his... Ma if you see William Lane Craig argue, that's, he, that's his argument. Ghazali made that argument and more than that argument. So for example, he said, look, one of his arguments that he made, which is also a cosmological argument, because a cosmological argument is an argument that makes reference to the cosmos, yes. literally to the, to, the, to the world around us. He said, look, he said that movement it's really what is it? It's, t it's time and mo um, uh, uh, movement. Time yeah, time is space. Uh, uh, he, he says, look, he says that if you believe in movement, he made an argument for movement, the first mover argument, yeah, yeah. which is the same argument as Aristotle. Aristotle. He said, if you believe in time, you believe in movement. So long as there is time, there is movement, and if there is, and if and if there is movement, there must be a mover. Yeah. That's yeah, another argument, yeah, yeah. right? So the argument of movement. Aristotle made that argument. Al Ghazali made that argument. Uh, Avicenna didn't reject the argument, but Avicenna said about that in his book, he said, look, he said just if you, he, and this is a good point, Avicenna said, just because there's a first mover, it doesn't necessitate that that first mover is the cause of everything that exists. Yes. So you can believe in a deistic first mover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can believe in the Albert Einstein God. Anyway, the first mover argument may, may um, give us evidence that there, there was in fact a first mover or an eternal mover. However, it doesn't give us evidence that that mover has intelligence or that that mover is the cause yeah, of everything that exists. From the Absolutely, yeah. No, all of the arguments, look, I'll be frank with you. The maximum we can prove from a logical perspective is deistic. Oh, really? Oh, you accept that? Yeah. Nice. Because if you put, look, if you, uh, if you define theism as a, as a personal god, then you can't, there's no real first principles you can use to establish that. Here's what we say. We say as Muslims is that our fundamental foundational definition of God 
doesn't depend necessarily on a, a personal God. That's additional information that that's we come. Christian concept as well, I think. Yeah, no, that's additional information that we only come to know ipso facto through revelation. So look, the necessary cause is this: everything in the world is dependent. Whether like this book is dependent on the materials, that it, whatever, and and it goes back, and you can't have that process not going back to something which is necessary. In other words, something which does not depend on anything else. As sim yeah. simple as that. So you have to have an independent to have all other dependent things. If you want to simplify the argument to the lowest common multiple. You have to have an independent to have all other dependent things. What are the attributes of that independent? That independent must be eternal because it couldn't be conceived of any other way at any other time. So it has to be like that forever. In the past, pre-eternal and post-eternal. It, it has to be necessary in the fact that it can't be conceived of any other way. And it has to be, um, for, it has to be the reason for everything else that exists, the ultimate reason. So your objection that you mentioned about the universe being the universe is not actually an objection, because all you're doing is you're saying that I believe in a, a necessary existence can can be, uh, can exist, but that necessary existence could be the universe. So someone could say, okay, well, so you agree with the premise of the argument, but you just agree with the nature of the necessary existence. So really, the, 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 the postulation, which is what Bertrand Russell kind of alluded to himself, and others as well, that, you know, the universe is, is the necessary existence. Yeah, it's I, not, think, I think it comes from you. Yeah, 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 of course, because he came before. But the point is that if, if you say that, it's not a rejection of the argument then. Oh, I see, I see what you see the point. So you, you accept the argument, but you just have a different na you have a different understanding of what could be, right? God. Yes. Oh, sorry, I wouldn't use the word God. The necessary the existence. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, the yeah, necessary, necessary existence. existence. Yeah, yeah. So at this point, that's not a rejection. It's not. A, it's not an objection to the argument, or a rejection of the argument. Yeah. You agree with the argument, but you say, okay, it could be the universe. So no problem. For now, we will not rule the universe out. But for now, we will explain why it won't be the universe in a second, right? But for now, but. Let's agree that, first of all, you accept that there must be a necessary existence. The other point of that Jupiter... I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that there is one, right. right. that's one objection. No, no problem. The point about Jupiter yeah, yeah. not being so the laws of nature or parts of things. So possible existence is two things that... It can, look, when they say mumkin al wujud or possible existence, there's two things that they talk about. Number one is that the thing could be conceived of in some other way, yeah. which is what you said, that Jupiter could not be conceived of in any other way. Yeah. But the other thing is dependence. Yeah. Right? Physical or ontological dependence. So if we talk about physical dependence, Jupiter by consensus is dependent on something else. It, and it, it, it is, but I, I posit, sorry. Yeah, that's awesome. I would posit that Jupiter is in some way, from an objectivist definition yeah. of necessary, because we sort of distinguish between the two. You could say actually Jupiter is necessary because, okay, forget the whole thing about conceiving, that's something that uh, yeah. maybe, maybe we don't like. But, um, you know, in terms of how it actually is, how it came about, could Jupiter have been any other way? Right, if we live in a fully deterministic universe, okay, well, physical determinism is, is true, and that's another thing. Right, 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 I get but, your point. Uh, yeah. You know, could, if, if whatever, whatever yeah, yeah. Jupiter is dependent on, let's say it's God, okay, let's, let's say it's Allah, all right? Here it goes, all the causal chain goes all the way back, or chain of explanation yeah, yeah, goes yeah. all the way back, right? God is necessary, okay, which means that this, you know, whatever has come from this necessary being must also be necessary. It comes right down to Jupiter. Jupiter couldn't have been any other way. If, if right, perfect, perfect. Yeah. Excellent, that's a really good uh, objection. I'm no, 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 that makes perfect sense to me. But so here, if you're, you're saying from a deterministic perspective, nothing can be any other way, yeah. which is absolutely correct. Yeah. yeah, in hard determinism. You're right. But then we have to ask the question, is determinism, what is determinism emanating from? Is there a determiner? Wow. You see? So, and if there is a determiner, is it, is it distinct from the necessary existence? You see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, the you know, ultimate, the right. here's something really interesting. The Greeks didn't really talk about determinism. No, you're right. Okay? Do you know who the first to talk about determinism was? I couldn't tell you. Alright, the Muslims were. Alright, the reason why is because they, the Arab philosophers, were introduced to the concept of determinism, which is not really present in the biblical discourse as much, from the Quran. The Quran says, uh, We created everything that in, uh, which is determined. We have created everything in determinism, right? That everything is determined. But who is the determiner? The necessary existence. Which makes a lot of sense because if look, if determinism, look, look at this. If determinism has to always be the case, 
which it does have to be, right? Uh, are you a determinist, by the way? Well, I'm a compatibilist, uh, and I'll tell you what that means. No, I, I know what that means. Yeah, right, so. I believe in determinism, and I also believe in the intuition of free will. So that's a compatibilist position, right? But it's a religious compatibilist position. Do you have atheistic compatibilists? What you might call a Molinist then? I don't know if you know that term. From the, there's a Spanish theologian, he's a Christian, Molina. Mm -hmm. he, he's, Molinism is the type of compatibilism when the determinism they're talking about is godly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's interesting, I'll look into that. That's, that's the point of research for me. But here's what I'll say to you, look. So, if determinism had to always be like that, then where is it emanating from or what is causing it to be? If it's not caused, if it's uncaused, then how is it uncaused? So and that would if, seem to undermine determinism. Right. Determinism itself so what is determinism dependent on or caused by? If you don't believe in cause, okay, fallacy of composition, we've all heard this stuff before, no problem. But if it is dependent on something, it has to be uh, dependent on a determiner. And the determiner can't be any other way. In other words, it can't be restricted by the rules of determinism. So we say the necessary existence is what causes the determinism. You see? Right. So that makes a lot of sense because it has to be eternal. If can, can I respond before you go on? Yep, yep, yep. Right. So I would say that hard determinists, yep. right, maybe it's, it's perfectly reasonable to be a hard determinist. Yep. I'm not saying that I'm one. Yep. I, think, I, I imagine most of them are probably um, atheistic because to be, if they, if they were religious in some sense, they'd have to believe in free will to, to some degree, right? So I think most hard determinists recognize that, yeah, you know, it can't go all the way back. So I think they say, okay, yes, let's say. What's the army as well? Infinite regress of the yeah, 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 infinite regress. So I think they said hard determinants, even though they hold this sort of, you know, yes, this causal chain must go on. I think they could still say yes, it has a beginning. Like it might have been uncaused at its mo at its first point, but that doesn't really change the fact that from that point on, determinism still still holds. Right, right, right. So look, here's what I would say. Go back to Ghazali's argument of movement, yeah, right? Yeah. The same thing can be applied to determinism. So long as there's movement, there must be a mover of some sorts. So long as there's determinism, there must be a determiner of some sorts. So what we're saying is that, what is the nature of that determiner? We're saying that determiner must be necessary. Because if that determiner was unnecessary or contingent, then there would not be determinism that always exists. Yeah, yeah the chain would break at some point. Uh -huh. So there has to be, if determinism is true, a necessary existence that causes such determinism is also true. Or how about this, if determinism is true, a determiner must be there. But, but the determiner is everything going up in the chain. So it's like this, this book, the determiner, is the author. And the you're talking about the causal chain, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, no, but if, you're if, talking about the ultimate. But if you believe in a causal chain, yeah. then we have the problem of infinite regress of causes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the point I'm making is that there's, a, there's one of two things. You can have your infinite regress of causes, but there, you can have it. Let's assume the possibility of an infinite regress of causes. We're saying that even if that infinite regress of causes theoretically takes place, if determinism always is there, it must be contingent on something which is necessary. If determinism is real, it's either contingent or necessary. Yeah, yeah. But, but and if it's contingent on something necessary, I think that's a contradiction. Surely, surely, if it was, especially if it's God, right, who wills this to be yes. this way, yes. right? that, that makes it not contingent. If it stems from a necessary being, okay, Why? I, don't see, I, I find it hard to reconcile. Basically, in fact, wait, 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 wait. Oh, yeah. sorry, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Say, say that again, sorry. Yeah, I find it hard to, to see how uh, anything that's going to be doing. Forget the term, right? Because we're getting a okay. here, right? But, uh, uh, any, any, you know, any causal chain, right? If, say, if, it has to come, if it comes from a necessary um, being, okay, I find it hard to see how it can then be contingent. If it stems, if it stems from a necessary, you know, it could not have been otherwise, right? And it's caused by something necessary, right? Then that thing that you're saying is contingent must also could not have been otherwise because it was caused by a necessary thing. Uh -huh. Which makes it, it can't yeah. be contingent. This is a yeah. In in the in the modern um, writings of. Of, of this kind of thing. This is called bootstrapping. Yeah, there, there's a philosophical concept here, it's called bootstrapping, which is that if something has a property, it can only emanate that which it has. In fact, that was actually the position of Avicenna. Yeah. He says, He said that, what, uh, 
But if God is one, he can only produce things or emanate things which are one. Or if this necessary existence is one, then the emanation of that thing must also be one. So in the same, in the same way, if God is necessary, then that which comes from God must also be necessary. Yes, there we go. Exactly. Is, that, is that right? Okay, so in a sense, there's, a, there's an element of truth in that, in the sense that wherever God wills is necessarily going to unfold, or whatever the necessary being wills or determines is necessarily going um, to, uh, to, uh, to unfold in that deterministic way. Okay? However, on the other hand, you could say this. You say that not everything of the first necessary being must be reproduced. Because if it was like that, then eternality would have to be reproduced as well. Now, the fact that we have time, the fact that we have time is a contradiction of that reality. Because especially if you believe in the beginning of time, if we say the necessary being must be eternal, and the existence of time, uh, especially a beginning of time, is by its nature not eternal, that must mean, right, that no, it's not necessarily the case that everything that springs from or stems from or emanates from or is produced from or created from the necessary existence is necessarily uh, of the same attributes of that thing in its exactness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're saying, you're saying that um, it's, it basically it's not going to reproduce everything from its, from its uh, cause, okay? And one of the things, one of the unreproduced things is the necessity. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, okay, yes. Right. And, you're, and sorry, just can you say again how, the, how time relates to it? Right, so as we said, look, the, 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 the bootstrapping idea is that if, if the necessary being is necessary, then that which emanates or is produced from or is caused by um, or is contingent on whatever, that necessary being must replicate, be a clone of, yeah. or must mimic the exact attributes of the necessary being. Which means that if it's necessary, the only thing it can produce is necessary things. Yeah. That's the idea. And what I'm saying is that part of necessity is eternality. Yeah. So because if necessary is defined as something that can never be otherwise, that can never be otherwise forever. Uh, pre-eternally and post-eternally but the existence of time is a contradiction to that to that notion well, it's a cosmological contradiction to that okay just elaborate on that that's the bit I wanted to so because time had a beginning time by its nature cannot if yeah, we're talking so you believe time is an emergent phenomenon, phenomenon. It, it, well time in its, if we're talking about it must be an emergent phenomenon okay you know what i probably agree with you yeah, if, if, i'll tell you if it's fundamental then it's like you're in big trouble because then then eternality basically exists no, no, it's, it, it, time as we know it here in the cosmos yeah, yeah. Is, an, is an emergent phenomenon. Okay, the existence of this emergent phenomenon, which is time, contradicts the reality, the, the point that anything that comes from the necessary existence or every, it must replicate the exact attributes. I see, I've, got you. I've just understood what you're saying. Yes, yeah, because, because eternality... Can't, if eternality can't exist within time. Yeah, okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Ah, and you there, would no be, there would be no emergent time, there would only yes, be eternality. Yes, yes. And, you're, and you're solving the, the God problem by putting God outside of time, aren't you? Yeah, so what we're saying, absolutely, so necessary existence is not, is not in the cosmos or subject to the rules of the cosmos. Right, because it's outside of time. Right? Yeah. So, because it's, it's not subject to the rules which it creates, or it produces, or it allows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, the, the point is this, is that if you look at the three objections you had about the universe we talked about, that's not really an objection. Uh, yeah, yeah no, that's human objection. Anyway. Right. I just wanted to see what So, um, we talked about that the, the necessary existence has to, to reproduce a necessary existence. We talked about how that can be resolved. The point is, is that everything, in a nutshell, everything dependent must depend upon something else which is dependent. And if that continues infinitely, regressively backwards, then you would never have the existence of anything. So you have to have an independent. And what we're saying is that the independent is our definition of God. It's the staple, the basic definition of God from an Islamic perspective is radically different from the definition of God from a Christian perspective. So a Christian will say it's triune God and so on, Jesus is God and all that stuff. We say, look, see, that's not the case. We say the, the basic definition of God for us is in chapter 112 of the Quran, which is that God is one and only. He, he, he doesn't beget. He doesn't beget, meaning he's eternal, right? He's pre-eternal and post-eternal. The Quran also says that he is the, he's the first and the last, meaning there's nothing before him and nothing after him. And so also, he is the necessary being, the independent one. So all of these features are features of God and they're necessary features. If you think about them ontologically or cosmologically, you must arrive at that. 
And so I feel like, um, do, are you convinced with that now? Uh, I, I'd respond just yeah. briefly. Or uh, well, is there any other objections that you have? No, 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 just carrying on from that, really. Yeah. I'm, I'm satisfied with those objections, yeah. but, but um, regarding infinite regrets, okay, because it's yes. one of the favourite, uh, Muslims say it all the time, right? Like, you guys say it more than the Christians do. I don't think the Christians have come across this infinite regression problem as much, but they say, you know, oh, you know, did something come from nothing? And you say, well, probably not. And then they say, okay, well, so otherwise there must be an infinite regress, or there must be. Um, I would say something else. Oh, you say something else? Yeah. So, okay. the exist there's, there's four possibilities. If I did a log logical disjuncture right now, I'd put down four possibilities. Creation ex nihilo, which is cr something from... Um, Something came from nothing. Which is what you believe, in a sense. Yeah, but something came from nothing with the agency of an yeah. ability that could do that. Number one, creation ex materia. Something came from something. The eternal universe or a fabric of space. Eternal universe put in brackets S, universes, world, worlds, whatever you want. Yeah, in the eternal fabric of space or whatever which is like multiverse theory or yeah. some conceptions well, of it. Which I reject, by the way. Right, good. And now the fourth thing is that you have something from nothing, which is absolutely ruled out logically. Yeah. I, no way atheists really believe that. Yeah, so something from nothing with no agency, no, no, it's impossible ontologically and cosmologically. We take that out. Yeah. The three possible things you've got here is creation ex materia. These are three logically valid options. Creation ex materia. I don't know, if you, if you take the ex nihilo option out, I don't see, I, I feel like it's special pleading that you leave, that you dismiss the ex nihilo, you know, the atheist ex, ex nihilo. Uh, the godless ex nihilo. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. I feel like it's, yeah, I feel like it's a special pleading fallacy to take the, um, the godless ex nihilo model out while um, retaining the, um, the godly ex nihilo, the creation ex nihilo model. No, I wouldn't say godly or non-godly, I'll just say agency-based. Yeah, agency, agency. Right, so if it's without agency, because when we say that, look, really when we're saying ex nihilo, we're not saying something from nothing, in an absolute sense, because we believe God was there, or there was, there was a necessary existence there, right? But what we're saying is that the, that agency brought about something, either from a pre-existing material, or from the absence of such pre-existing material. Now, if you say, look, if that is not the case, what is the alternative? The zero plus zero hypothesis is, is untenable, it's impossible. Yeah, and again, no one really believes Yeah, no one believes in that. So we're left with three things. All three of them require some kind of agency though. Okay, all oh, right. Or some kind of independent necessity to, 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 to under... under uh, we, can we have a closing statement? Yeah, okay. Oh, I would say, Hart, oh, there was one thing I really did want to ask you, okay, which is, what do you make, then, of, um, I think, it, yeah, it's an incoherence, it's, it's a point by Al-Ghazali responding to, you know, oh, do you know what, I don't know who, I might have been Avicenna, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he, where he said, um, okay, this idea of God as the necessary being, okay, and he, and he said, how, this is, this is nonsense, how can you say this, this is a disgrace to the Islamic like, argument to come up, uh, and he says, because if, God's, right, God's will to create, okay, is, is an element of God. I feel like you know what I'm going to say, okay? Now, if, if that's an element of God, okay, then it must also be necessary, because all elements of God are necessary. But if God's will and, and God's creation of, of the world and of the universe, of you know, matter, um, is necessary, okay, that negates God's free will. So al Ghazali said, stop, stop saying that God is necessary in all his aspects. So what do you make of that then? No, no, Ghazali didn't say God is not necessary. He maintained that God is necessary. Right. He, but he, he was attacking Avicenna because Avicenna said that God, he didn't create the universe from choice. Ah, okay. Yeah, Ibn Sina, Avicenna, he, he said that God emanated, the, he believed in emanation theory, like you know how you have a sun and the rays of that sun, which is rejected by Sunni Muslims, yeah. rejected by Al-Ghazali, rejected by Ibn Taymiyyah, rejected by... Rejected by the Shia as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, all of all of the Muslims, no right? Religion. Yeah, no, no, even Jews but don't believe. All Abrahamic religions believe God has a will. Avicenna is saying God was compelled to create the universe, or almost it's like it's, it's emanated the universe out. He's saying no, God had to have a will. 
So that was a discussion that's in my book as well, I think. Yeah, that you might have read it there. We're going to have to wrap up. Yeah, sorry. Right. So thank you very much. Oh, yeah, you can. No, 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 that's it. There's, there's a ton of people that I want to say. Thank you for Jay Dilla Mohammed and Jabra Lee's question. I hope you guys are benefiting from learning at home. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, man. Thank you. Good one. Man. You too, man. Thank you. Oh, wait, can, I, can I get a picture of you? That right? Yeah, of if course, man. And Ali as well. Let's yeah. just fucking. Uh, let's take. He wants a picture with us. Yeah, let's go. Are you gonna come in my car? Because they're going to that restaurant.